first session will be by Ben Snow, Civocracy, Learning from Setback, Civocracy and Citizen Consultations. Ben. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Is that all right? Sorry, could you move to the front while you're speaking? Oh, okay. sure. Right. Sorry about that. I told you different. Is that better? Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks for all joining. Uh, this is, I, you know, I guess none of you care about women uh, gaining funding or well-being, which is interesting. Uh, no, um, and I also, I'm not going to do slides if that's all right. I feel like there's a certain PowerPoint uh, fatigue at things like this eventually at some point in the afternoon after lunch, so I'm just going to share a bit. Um, so my name is Benjamin Snow. I'm from an organization called Civocracy. We're a Dutch company run by an American and a French person based in Berlin that mostly works in France. So, if you think that's confusing, it's because you have no faith in Europe. We are a European company. Uh, we are proving the mission of Europe and that it can be done. Uh, and it's, it's easy enough, which means it's not very easy. Um, that said, so what we do is we work with local, regional, and national governments. We have an online platform that helps involve citizens in uh, participating and giving feedback towards local decision making, uh, which is very similar or kind of very aligned to what almost everyone in this room does. Uh, and so I'm going to leave a lot of times for kind of discussion and question and answer because I feel like the uh, collective intelligence of this room is quite high. And so I, I don't want to talk very much because that's part of what we do is we know that Anyone who's usually given the microphone only holds a bit of the key to solving a problem, and so opening that up to a wider community is really important. But I did want to start with a bit of an anecdote. So part of this uh, got pitched essentially as lessons learned. Uh, so I want to talk about when stuff doesn't go well, um, which isn't all of the time, and that's important, uh, but it's some of the time. And so it's kind of a tale of two cities. So two cities that we worked with. One that went really, really well, and one that went not very well, and kind of why we think that is. Um, and so one was the city of Potsdam. If you guys know Potsdam, nice city, has kind of a touristy thing you go visit. It's outside of Berlin, good universities. Uh, another one was the city of Lyon. Uh, one we worked with in 2016, the other one we started working with in much later 2016 and still work with now. Um, and what we were in both cases, you have kind of the very kind of starting point of we want to involve citizens in understanding kind of what they believe about the work that we're doing or in how we understand what we're doing, which is great. So that's fantastic. We're, we're in the same point. Cut forward several months. In one case, you've engaged dozens of citizens and in another thousands. And in one case, you have basically nothing you can kind of take away from it and there's very little momentum towards the project, and in the other, it's, okay, this is what we're doing, this is organizational change, we should be doing this all the time. So what went differently? Kind of what, you know, you hear about people who are doing the same thing on paper, and then how it goes radically different, and trying to understand kind of what the parsing bits of that is, is, is very difficult. So what we found were a few things. One, it depends a lot on what you're trying to engage citizens about. So the, the one with Potsdam, was about, they wanted feedback around a project that they were doing to involve citizens in the local uh, government administration. That sounds great, right? That sounds wonderful. Why is that bad? Because no one knew about that project at all. So you're asking for feedback about how they like something that they didn't know existed, like a little bit. And so when you're trying to pull feedback from people very broadly and about something that they have no context towards, they aren't likely to want to talk to you. Versus Lyon, we had a number of topic areas around changing local, uh, the local elementary uh, primary education system. So this affects a lot of people, it affects them very personally, and it affects them over a long period of time. And it has a very strong constituent group. And so it's something where people know how it affects their lives, they know why it affects their lives, and it's something where the answers aren't obvious. So if you're asking people, uh, should we build the road, build the road, don't build the road, usually those are quite straightforward. Something, however, that can seem str quite straightforward from a policy perspective can be quite complex. So what is the actual problem with changing the start and stop time of a school day? Scheduling, 
Daylight savings? No. It's when do the parents have to go to work? What sort of after school and before school support is already built into that system? Kind of uh, even uh, how, when you start what day for what student affects who can babysit, what age groups can take care of what other children later. These are all things that aren't usually taken into account when making these decisions, but when you kind of start from a citizen-centric perspective, suddenly you get a lot more feedback about what your actual problem is. So that was one, is, is content that actually affects people's lives like really, really directly. The other one is when we started in Potsdam, we had one guy, we had one champion who was really excited about it. That, doesn't, that never works. <laughs> so if you are the one champion in your organization for doing something participative, if you're the, if you're the you know, Joan of Arc of citizen participation, I don't know how that reference carries in France actually, I hope that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Napoleon? Maybe worse. Uh, so if you, are the, if you are the figurehead of this for your organization, go make friends. Because when you get sick, go on parental leave, have the pro get shifted to the other project, what have you, or you simply get a new project that's put on your table and you have less time, it sputters. And the worst thing that happens when it sputters is you're doing citizen participation. So when you do that poorly, you're actually making it worse than when you started in the worst case scenario. You are breaking trust because people are getting involved on the idea that something will get better or that there will be some uh, reciprocity or some feedback or something in their community will change. And when that disappears, it's worse than you not being there in the first place. And so we take that responsibility really seriously, but we were in a case where we had the guy who was really enthusiastic about it in the IT department who then wasn't on that project anymore and you're suddenly trying to rebuild support within an organization. So you need a kind of a community of support. So a lot of what we do now, what we learned from that was we start really transversally. We go into, you think of your city or your uh, local town as your local town or your local administration, you go into every department. Everybody has different mandates. You have to, everybody should be aware of what you're doing. Everybody should know how it affects the work that they're doing. You have to start really transversely. Everybody needs to know how they can use this and how they can do participation because it shouldn't be something that just sits with the innovation department or the citizen participation department or the mayor's PR guy. It has to be something that really sits across all of the different aspects of government or at some point it gets abandoned and then you become one more empty box on the internet. And you do not want to be one more empty box on the internet because that, that just, that lack of motivation and that lack of movement really hurts you. Um, so working really transversely. So we now, any city, any region that we work with, it's about how do we get as much buy-in and as much awareness and as many projects going as possible so that this isn't left with that one guy. Um, the other thing I, I'll mention with that is uh, design is really important. So you'll notice that everything I've talked about until now as a civic tech company is not technology. Technology is, I think, one of the le lesser important things in doing civic participation online. Uh, this is why you see a lot of really bad civic participation stuff get built and then be empty, be one more empty box on the internet, and it's because all of the other aspects are really important. Um, and so how do you communicate with people? How do you build that promise? How do you build that community? How do you retain that community? It's all much more important. And so training people to own that process rather than handing them a piece of software is really, really important. And that's, you know, if you're the OECD, if you're NATO, if you're a national government doing the, the, you know, grand consultations that are happening now down to the local town, there's the assumption that the more local you go, the more you kind of just know everybody. And that's not, that doesn't really work that way. And so you have to really build that, uh, that relationship as strong as possible, and you have to kind of build that up as, as robustly as possible. However, technology can matter. So when we did this in Potsdam, and it didn't work very well, we had a pretty basic platform that didn't communicate regularly and iteratively and effectively what the government was doing and what was happening in the project and how people were uh, being involved participatively as much as it could. And what we built into it, so now what we do, what worked in Lyon, is now if the city, it's a small thing, so if the city reads your comments so that you've been heard, you know about it. 
If somebody responds to you, you get an email. If there's an update to the, the decision, and then kind of how you build in from a design perspective the nudges that make the government feel like they really need to do that. And so you think that they're enthusiastic, and but these are busy people. They have stuff to do. You, some of you work in government. You have a lot of priorities. So making that as easy as possible and making them feel like they kind of need to do it is really important. And so designing technology that is user friendly on a basic level, but also is a trust building mechanism, is is really important. Um, and then the last thing is, what are the outcomes? So with this weird project in Potsdam, where nobody really understood what the thing was in the first place, how can they create an expectation of how it would improve? Versus when you're saying, we're changing the local environmental law, which will have these effects and these effects. People know how that will affect their business or their life or their local education or their kids. And that gives them much more of an expectation of what will come out of this. And so you both have to give them outcome of you've been hurt, but also where the policy process will change. But then the other part of that is you also have to make them understand that that won't happen overnight. And so most people kind of reasonably understand that things take years. However, if you just kind of ping them and then leave them alone and come back to them two years later, then they might have forgotten what the hell you're talking about. And they might be mad that you haven't talked to them in the last two years. And so how you create this kind of regular communicative relationship, even when stuff works at the pace of government, which I think all of us kind of understand what that pace can be, is, is really important. And so what you want to do is kind of those aspects, is you need to, for things to work well, in our estimation, have this kind of transversality across the organization. You want to have good design so that you're creating these feedback loops. You want to have a clear outcome, and you want to have content that people actually understand and know about and have a relationship to. And that's the difference between having a really great case study for civic participation and one that you kind of don't want to talk about but only feel obligated to once in a while at the OECD. Thanks. Questions now or questions after? I probably prefer to questions after, so if we okay. get both speakers first and then. Perfect. Yeah, questions around. Right, so our second speaker is Marcos Gorek, who is talking about being unsocial on social media. Sorry, did everyone hear me just then when I wasn't using the microphone? No, that's fine. No? Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Marcos Gorek, who is talking about being unsocial on social media. Here we go. I will give you, yeah, up to half an hour, so if you want sure, to go. Sure, sure. Um, is there a clicker? There. I am, I'm just switch these. Okay, so maybe something that you did not expect, but uh, I think it's still kind of important to hear about how we are unsocial social media. Because social media is also for being unsocial, not antisocial, just un unsocial. Okay, um, I want to start by um, saying this. So uh, this is something that a colleague in uh, political communication said, Devan Shah, that uh, conversation is the soul of democracy. So if you're doing a lot of monologues, even if you're doing dialogues, it's not sufficient. You need to have many, many conversations with a probably fairly broad cross-section of society. So if we start with this idea that we need conversations, um, social media platforms did look very good for that purpose. They looked kind of ideal. You can connect with a lot of different people and all that. Um, but here's what happened. So <clears throat> we've been talking as humans for probably a few hundred thousands of years, right? And we've had democracy for depending where you're at, from a few thousand years to a few years or never. Um, but only in the past 10 years or so, we have a capacity to basically record or mediate daily conversations, everything we say, right? Now, with that said, only about 5% of conversations are captured, so 95% is still face-to-face. -face. But still, for the first time, you have a situation where these, the essence of democracy, if you believe it, that conversation is the sole democracy, is being recorded, and of course what's interesting is being monetized. So not only you record other people's conversations, but you're trying to make money of it, right? So these are kind of new things, and I think they're kind of related to a lot of uh, conversation we're having here about civic and political impact of social media. So what I'm gonna do is remind you, because everyone here is, I think, old enough to remember, um, the time, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, when we were just starting this conversation about social media and democracy. Uh, let's go back to 
2007. And that was a great year. That's where Facebook became global. And um, I was doing research on Facebook, and we were very excited, and we thought that it will change everything, right? So usually everything changes everything. Every new tech changes everything, and democratizes, and the uh, you know, other things will... I'll, I'll, I'll remind you of some of these promises. <clears throat> so one of the first articles was about the benefits of Facebook friends, how it's great to have many Facebook friends, and they'll help you with social capital, and they'll help you with your uh, uh, well-being, mental well-being, and you will connect with people you were never imagined connected with. This is also done by a group of my colleagues. So I love this stuff. I've cited it hundreds of times. Um, we also talked about something that's called context collapse. So the idea that on Facebook at that time, you had you know, your friends, your bosses, uh, some random people you met at the party when you were drunk and you don't remember them anymore, um, and increasingly your parents. And that this kind of uh, cross-cutting exposure to information and engagement with these people would be a beneficial for democracy. I mean, we're looking at normative expectations, of course, here. So people who you would not talk to usually, well, since they're on Facebook and you're on Facebook, you're li more likely to talk to them. And again, we were kind of excited about this. We were like, well, this is great. I can hear the other side. Um, well, fast forward 2011. And there, we were still we were still excited about it. We were still excited about it. Um, this time, we think that Facebook is going to crush these authoritarian governments, um, and we call this an army of Davids. So many people will rise up, and the bloggers will rise up, and the dictators will go away. Um, as you probably know, if you look at the uh, data from most kind of uh, reliable sources, the democracy has actually been in decline in most places. So it looks like something is going on here. Um, one thing I want to say is that one reason why we have these kind of clashing views of technology is that we, number one, suffer from these ever-present liberation narratives. That we want to liberate ourselves and other people, and it's kind of easiest to do it with technology. Right? It's very difficult to liberate yourself without technology. Imagine you have to, for instance, change fundamentals of your society. That's very difficult. But if you can invent a technology that's relatively straightforward and people would use this technology to change, for instance, their status, that would be fantastic. Um, 2013, I think it's a crucial year. We learned that governments spy on us, for those of you who didn't know. Right? <laughs> <coughs> um, it was a shock. Um, I don't think it was a shock, actually, to anyone, but it just made people aware that these things exist. And for those of you who are keen um, followers of political history, you had exactly the same thing happening with Cardinal uh, Metternich's rule. So during his rule, people withdrew from society and cafes, and they withdrew to their living rooms or, or salons and started talking in smaller groups because spies were everywhere. And you know, people were not comfortable disclosing this information in public places. So as a consequence, if you think about it, 2013, what's happening after 2013? A lot of us have shifted to, you know, WhatsApp, uh, Viber, Line, uh, you know, all these things where we talked, we still talk to each other, but it's not public and it's kind of encrypted. Right? <clears throat> all right, 2016. Uh, why is 2016 important? Because we have what uh, Sean Tiger calls hyperpolarization. This is, of course, the U.S. election context, but uh, in many countries you have the same concerns that people have stopped talking to each other, especially those on the opposite sides of the political spectrum. Right? Um, and the whole idea that we were talking about in 2007, that yes, it's great to hear so many different views and engage with them and have friends from places that you've never been to, that's great, right? Well, this time, it looks like it's not. That it's actually helping us hate each other more. Um, 2018. Also, I think, an important year. Um, and it's kind of showing us what's about to come, I think. Um, again, not a big surprise here. I mean, everyone who was in the business knew that these things were happening. So I don't really know what the fuss was about Cambridge Analytica. I think lots of us were doing similar things, not at this scale. And we were not using it necessarily to target voters. But we are collecting data. I mean, we're in the data business, right? And then GDPR that kind of says, well, slow down. And I think there's going to be GDPR too, and that we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, so, where do we go from here? 
Um, the research that we are doing, and this is a group of maybe two or three of us, and there's some colleagues around the world who are kind of, I think, focusing on similar theme, themes. Um, this idea that social media is being reconfigured, the social media sphere is being redesigned, sometimes by people through basically usage. So people use social media in very different ways, right? So there was a paper published about a year or two ago which said, well, some people in Turkey have 12 Facebook profiles, right? One for a wife, one for a girlfriend, one for a girlfriend from abroad, one for your friends, right? One for your children, right? So you have multiple profiles. So how does that fit with this idea of one profile, one identity transparency, right? So what, some, some of these things are about how people actually use technology versus the intended uses. In some ways, it's about actual redesign of technologies. So, of course, first big change is that if you look at your own use, probably most of it is encrypted now, and we don't see it. Um, I was very excited maybe five, six years ago how I'm going to basically get all the data in the world, go Twitter, get, collect everything, Facebook, great. Okay, now I can't collect anything anymore. I have to do interviews. Interviews are, you know, 19th century sort of data collection method, but we kind of have to use them again. Um, so this is the first shift. Um, the second shift is something that also makes sense, which is what they call ephemeral social media. Um, we don't like necessarily being sort of hold to the records. A lot of things that we say on a daily basis are not to be recorded, not to be archived, not to be remembered. And especially if you're 18 years old or 16 years old, you don't really want these things to stay. And of course, you don't want your father and mother and all these boring adults uh, to have access to this, right? So you have a very simple platform that just changed the business model slightly. We promise you that your parents or no one else will see it. Um, and then something that we really pay attention to, which is this phenomenon of political unfriending. Um, and I think there is a more uh, kind of global or bigger picture here, which is about uh, disconnection. I'll talk about this in a second. So this is data from um, most of these studies are our studies. Uh, the um, Israeli study is from a colleague, uh, Nicholas John. The rest is from uh, data that we collected together. So these are. Um, percentages of political unfriending across the world in different years. You will obviously see an outlier here. Again, not very surprising outlier. Um, and what's interesting about US is that this is just during the elections. This is a normal situation, periodic elections. There's nothing unusual about it, right? If you look at Hong Kong, this is Hong Kong during the umbrella movement when the whole city was blocked for three months. It's a very unusual situation, a high level of conflict, high level of polarization. Israeli Gaza armed conflict, people are getting killed. Yet the number of people unfriending is probably half of what um, you had in the US during the elections. Yes, please. Sorry, maybe I missed this. One, where did you get the data? And two, when it says 10, 20, and 30, uh, does that mean 30 people? Uh, percent, percent, percentages. Percent, yeah, yeah. So 10, 20, 30 percent. So these are the percentage of people who say, I have unfriended someone for political reasons in the past, you know six months or three months or whatever. And is that a self-selecting survey? Uh, no, it's a national representative survey, so done by professional companies, so professional market research companies. So, I mean, is it really accurate? Uh, if we have people from Facebook, they will probably tell us. But, um, I don't know. I just collect survey data. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so there's a bigger story out there. The bigger story is about disconnection. So think about the best technology to disconnect from people. So if you want to avoid certain people, what do you need to know about these people? You need to know their habits, their religion, their personality, what kind of friends they associate themselves <coughs> with, how much money they make, where they live. And you have all this data. What teenagers do today is they check on people online before they become friends in real life. Right? So it's completely rational strategy. You go online, you check someone out and say, wow, this, uh, this looks like an asshole. Like, I'm not going to be his friend. Now, we're not looking at that. We're just looking at processes that people use to disengage. Okay? The first one is very simple. Um, selective affiliation. Right? So you don't add everyone to your Facebook profile. You don't everyone add everyone on LinkedIn. 
right? But even if you're fairly selective, sometimes you make mistakes. And when you make mistakes, then you engage in a fancy term post hoc filtration. Get rid of them, right? And yes, people are doing this a lot. And of course, there's some filtering that's happening thanks to social and other media companies because that's how it is, right? So you end up with a slightly different group of people from our normatively kind of desirable, diverse group of people and all that. Um, so what I think we're seeing now is not context collapse, but context relapse. If you look at your phone, I can guarantee that on a daily basis, you probably speak to about three to 10 people, excluding work groups. If you look at individuals, so individual context that you talk to every day, it's guaranteed that it's not more than 10 people. For most of us, it's about five, okay? So that's where a lot of action happens. Most of the action, most of our discussion, again, remember discussion is, or talk is, it's all democracy, happens among five people, okay? So what we do and what we see now is that we tried for maybe a decade or so this open mode of communication. It was kind of exciting and you post silly things and you get comments from you know, people across the world, it's great. But then we're like, well, actually I don't have time for this, right? Unless you are in tech or you're in PR, you really don't have time for social media, right? Why, why would you, right? You have a job, you have children if you do, and you have to commute, you have to eat, you have to sleep, at least some of us. I haven't slept a lot, but it's all right. Um, so what we see is that we are shifting to the platforms that actually support a very old mode of communication, which is this small group communication, ephemeral communication that disappears. We talk and then we disappear, and of course everything is encrypted so you can't really see it. Um, probably the most interesting reference here is Dunbar. So Robin Dunbar, who is a kind of evolutionary anthropologist, who studies apes and studies people and all that. And he basically says, well, you know, we can have about 150 friends or so, and yes, some of us can have 200 or some of us can have only 100, but that's about it. And the core group is about five. The next group is about 20. So we don't really have a lot of people that really we want to talk to. Now, this is kind of a basic uh, social psychology or, or anthropology. So how does it sort of connect with a bigger picture of citizen engagement? One of the issues that we're facing in our research is that when we find um, exposure on social media that's normatively desirable, like being exposed to different views, cross-cutting views, different people from different class, from different race. Okay? That's a good thing, right? Yes, but to this difference, we tend to react with unfriending or blocking. So in the last elections, about 30% of Americans reacted to exposure to difference by blocking people, right? We also know that lots of people get kind of confrontational online. We measured that in three countries and we found that yes, being confrontational also makes you more likely to uh, unfriend people. So you're kind of an online bully. And we probably know some. Sometimes we do scam bullying and trolling. It's kind of fun. But this is the problem, right? So normatively, again, we were talking for many years about the strength of weak ties, these cross-cutting ties. And they're very important in society, social glue, social capital, etc. right? But it looks like they're a little, a little bit weaker than we expected. So yes, we're connected with these people, but whenever there is some kind of uh, challenge or social upheaval, we tend to unfriend these people. All right, so what's kind of the, the, the take home here? So yes, there is a greatest increase in expressive capacity, okay. But that's kind of changing too. And there are some, I think, challenges ahead. One really interesting piece of kind of relatively new research, it's only been about 10 years, is about what makes us change our minds or what makes us do things in life. Since I'm a communication or media professor, then we usually talk about transmission of information. So I tell you something and I persuade you. So I tell you a story and I persuade you not to vote for the guy and persuade you to vote for someone else. That was the dominant view, the view of persuasion, right? So there is a transmission of information and there is a uh, transmitter and a receiver. 
But there is another interesting thing, which is that some of the strongest effects are the effects of self-expression. So if I say if you're in front of 50 people that I'm going to vote in the next elections, I will probably be more likely to do so just because I said it. And of course, if you said it in front of people you know, that makes it even more likely. So that means people who go and talk about their preferences all the time and about what they're going to do are probably more likely to actually do it. And then also people who don't do this are less likely to do it, which means the vocal ones are the ones who will participate more. Right? So something also to think about. So the, our gut reaction when we're doing this research is that, well, if people are withdrawing from this kind of a garden of Eden where you can get so much different information and if they're withdrawing into these small groups, this must be kind of a polarizing effect. These are the eco chambers, right? It looks like that may not be the case. It looks like that w once you feel safe, when you're in a small group of people that you trust, you can actually say and hear different things. To give you an example, um, how many of you have different political preferences from your parents? Great. Is this a problem when you have dithers? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. Would you stop going for family dinners because of this? No. That's right. That's right. Because we value these relationships more than politics. So here's the funny thing. Um, it may not really be about eco chambers. It might be about protecting yourself, your personal thing. And you know how close we are with our technology. I don't want people posting nasty, bigoted, racist comment on my feed. They can post somewhere else. This is good for, I'm good with that, but not on my feed, not on my profile, right? So there's a protection of this kind of mediated space that might be at work. There's another thing. People might be carving their own digital safe spaces. So places where you can say things that you can no longer say in open social media. Now, some of these things are bad, some of these things are okay. And yes, yeah, some of them are outright scary. But these safe spaces, at least the just research that we just started uh, uh, working on, shows that they're actually depolarizing, which was kind of counterintuitive. Like, I thought, if I am in the group with five of my best friends, I'm gonna become less tolerant, right? Not necessarily, not necessarily. This could be especially important for those who are disenfranchised or who are minorities. Because when they go out and start talking, they immediately attack, they get either attacked by trolls. But if you're in a safe group, well, you know, you talk for a while, for a week or two or a month or two, you gain some confidence, you practice your skills, and then you get to the big out world, you know, there, and maybe you participate. So, a really big picture here. So we have a global duopoly on advertising right now, right? This advertising is fundamentally based on personal information. And we have to think about what the democracies that most of us live in, I, I, I'm kind of an exception, but semi-democracy, okay. Um, whether they're built on the same idea that you extract information from citizens, okay? And based on that information, you present them with different versions of reality. That's basically what democracy is not about, right? The version of reality in democracy should be similar to most of us, not customized for different people, right? Um, it gets a little more interesting, too, because there is now talk in the academic community, at least, that stop, that stop talking about social media companies as media companies or social networking companies. They call them data extraction companies. They're not about media. They're not about social networking. They're about extracting information. And of course, some of these things can be regulated. Right? And I, my guess is, and if you're watching what's happening in the United States right now with the Democratic candidates, some of them are saying, we're going to break you. We're going to break you. Okay? And I don't think there is a critical mass for that, but there is definitely, for the first time, talk about breaking up the giants. 
which for me is very surprising. I never expected that. And of course, the bigger, even bigger question is about transparency and privacy. And you know, what is the, I guess, the right balance of it? Because a lot of people are very concerned about privacy, and they use disclosure or transparency as a strategic tool in persuasion. Remember influencers. Influencers tell you what they eat for breakfast. They tell you where they shower. Right? They disclose a lot of information because it's a strategic thing in presenting themselves as authentic and basically increasing their persuasive power. That's it. Let's talk. <laughs> These both the speakers. Uh, there isn't a second mic in this room, is there? No. OK, that's fine. Uh, so basically what we'll do now is we get our two speakers back to the front of the room. Uh, I will take questions in the groups of three. If I ask the speakers to repeat the question that we're answering in turn, just so in case people couldn't pick it up the first time. And we'll, there's a lot of people in the room. Hopefully there's a lot of questions. If not, we'll go until we're finished, and then we'll leave. So. Cool, so are there any questions? Uh, hands right up, sorry. One, three, four. Okay, so I'm going to do. Yeah, I'll try to. No, that's not going to work, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so, uh, sorry, can you start with you? Sorry, uh, sorry. Okay, go okay, we'll put the phones back up again. <laughs> cool, so yes, it's starting here. Hi, I'm Yasmina from Integrity Action. Thank you very much for both presentations, really, really engaging. In my mind, um, they're speaking to, pointing to two different things. So Benjamin, you spoke about towns that are collecting the feedback from citizens, and then you said, but how do you deal with the situation where you know that the government will be able to respond? It will take a year or two. You, we are asking citizens to be patient. And then, Mark, we are talking about very impatient crowd that's very private and behaves very differently. So my question is to you, knowing what you know about how we behave in this artificial space, what are the key top three things you would give to Benjamin and to people like us? What is it that we need to do to harvest that behavior, to harvest those nudges, to get citizens to be more proactive in that civic space for them to really drive transparency, accountability, and be defenders of, of our democracies once again. Thank you. Hands back up. Cool. Uh, go with. Uh, yeah. um, so I think there were, uh, with the, the first presentation, there was something in there about. Uh, the difficulty of civic tech as a hack around democracy that isn't functioning versus civic tech as infrastructure that has a design to it that's designed to last for a long time. And I was kind of interested because I think there's this tension in, in a lot of the, the talks that we've got here about basically whether you're doing service design work for a government on contract, which is designing government services, or whether you're doing civic technology work, which might not be so might not be so involved in government itself. And I was wondering if you could perhaps say a little bit more about that tension. Um, also, with the uh, second talk, I'm a little concerned about there's a lot of assertion there. We kind of knocked out the idea of interviewing people at the start as a 19th century thing. I should point out, I'm from an anthropology department. Um, <laughs> ask people. Like, there's, a, there's a singular narrative there of like, here are the things that happened in social media that year. I didn't see something that happened in civic tech that kind of balanced out what was happening in that space. The internet is not, uh, the internet is a, an oligopoly, of course, but it's not just happening on Twitter and Facebook. And ascribing, ascribing uh, affective behavior feels, feels strong. And I'm, I, I'd, I'd like to hear a bit more of the, a bit more of the qualitative evidence you're using to create that narrative. And a question right at the back. Yes, a question for Benjamin. Um, really interesting presentation. Um, you spoke a lot about the process of public engagement. Um, I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on what it was about those two projects, why one was so much more successful than the other. You alluded very briefly to participation numbers. I just wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how you're measuring the impact of public engagement activities. 
Um, how do you know when one has had a really good impact, and how are you measuring that um, relative to the one that you said didn't go so well? Thank you. Do you want to start? Uh, Your choices. Sure. Um, great. So I appreciate the questions. Uh, to the first one was specifically around that time lag of expectation versus implementation and the, the relationship around that. I find that most of the time there's no communication uh, between government and citizens of, or that uh, that relationship is basically, there's kind of the construction project and there's the billboard in front of the construction project telling you this is funded maybe by the EU and it'll be here before your children you know, need it uh, vaguely. And so it's, it's kind of a lot of what we encourage is just that, that there's an appreciation by people that large projects and, and large actions within government and a lot of stuff that takes place as infrastructure or kind of very large scale projects takes time and people understand that. But you have to kind of create a com continual communication loop for to, to kind of keep people and, and kind of I think that it's very easy for government to have the mindset that everyone else is tracking what you're doing as closely as you are in that way that everybody who kind of works in their field feels that everyone else should know exactly what's going on in their field really intimately when it kind of matters to you and doesn't really matter to anybody else nearly as much. And so I think that appreciation of kind of the average person on the street isn't paying that much attention and only kind of occupying them, communicating with them regularly, but only doing it deliberately and substantively is really important. And I think that's another kind of differentiation is, so we aren't designed for people to use it constantly. And I think that's a big thing is social media is designed and, and measures itself by how can I get as many people to spend as much time on this as possible. And you can say it's because they're data extractive and you want to collect as much data as possible, or you can say that it's because it's advertising based and you want to run a lot of ads. We're specifically designed so that we're not trying to harass you all the time because if you do that, it, people get really pissed off. It doesn't go well in the civic tech space to try to create something that runs ad-based or runs on this kind of perpetual loop of interaction because often the government or whoever is active in that space doesn't have a continual uh, minute by minute update of the, the legislation passing or that sort of thing. And so creating something that isn't driven specifically on an advertising or a data basis is really important to us because I don't believe, it's, it's kind of should be there and important to you when there's something important and relevant. And it, it's like kind of that important function, but that doesn't need to be kind of constant. And I think that that instructs a lot of how we think of business models and how we think of kind of how you craft that relationship with people. Um, to the second question, it was around um, service design versus civic tech and um, the, the democracy versus kind of institutional. So I think there's a lot of good work being done in just kind of like providing digitalization of basic government services. Uh, I don't view that as what kind of core civic tech does. I think that part of public services is communication, true, uh, but a lot of kind of basic digitalization stuff like that, that can happen. The difference I think with civic tech is usually good civic tech is scalable. So I think the worst cases of kind of that government, uh, government service design is they're trying to create something for a town and then build the next thing for the next town and build the next thing for the next town or sell it to the, all of them in isolation and run their little project up and then disappear. And I think that good civic tech is looking to create an ongoing uh, continual relationship basis presence so that they're not just essentially disappearing. And I think that, um, so that's one element to it. I think the other part of it is, so we're scalable. We work with small cities of 30,000 up to regions. Uh, in France, we work with auvergne rhone alpes so millions. Um, City of Lyon, Nice, so we work with also really big you know, ministries. Um, and so being something where a person can go somewhere and interact with their town, their city, their region, and the relevant ministries all in one place is civic tech versus I've got a different web page portal thing that's spun up 
uh, for each one of those is is that I think is another kind of core core difference to that that I think differentiates uh, like good good civic tech. However, I do think that kind of consulting governments on a local level about how to do that well is can look like a contract and a contract basis, but is an important part of it. Um, and then the third question from our friends at Nesta uh, about measuring impact after doing their session on measuring impact this morning. So, I like uh, <laughs> it's. For us, we do stuff that's everything from very small uh, projects that really only concern a few hundred people up to stuff that affects thousands and sometimes millions of people. And so you don't want to do it based upon number of eyeballs and you don't want to do it based upon uh, amount of time on the page. Uh, so there's kind of a lot of the paradigms of social media are relevant to good civic tech. Uh, what we're looking for is also not what changed uh, I think change.org and kind of the petition model was early civic tech and it created this feeling that like you're only doing it right if we change like do the opposite of what we were doing last month and as we all know sometimes what you're doing now might be the best thing to be doing and so measuring it based upon just what did we shift based upon the noise of the group also doesn't instruct that so what we really look for is how do you kind of have new ideas how are those ideas informed and what is the support and the kind of understanding of the group, the collective intelligence of the community around that problem, and is that informing a better decision? Um, so very briefly, could go a lot deeper on all of those. Thanks. Um, I'm trying to, to address the first one without um, overreaching, because I'm not an activist, and uh, I, I used to be, but it was a long time ago, we didn't use much tech back then. So, um, you know, well, what's the, what do we know about engagement in general? So, what we know about engagement in general is that, first of all, you have a difference between civic and political engagement. I'll come back to this. I think these are very important differences. You know, caring about your community versus electing a specific person as your president, that's very different. <coughs> uh, and uh, the second thing is, um, as I said, about expression. So, if expression is, um, let's say, followed by some kind of discussion or engagement that usually increases the probability of any kind of participation, physical participation. So we know that. We've done hundreds of studies of this. Um, one thing I would say, I think in recent years what's been emerging is that the combination of online and offline is the most effective one. And there's a critical size of groups. Right? So organizing 500 people is very difficult. Organizing 50 people is probably OK. If you have, as Benjamin said, if you have one champion, that's probably not enough. Um, but if you have five or 20, I think that's, that's probably OK. Um, we looked at successful models in, in Asia, local neighborhood kind of problems. And usually these days on, on uh, instant messaging platforms. So they're kind of private and protected. But, and these are people who may know each other face to face as well. Um, and the combination of that with offline events, I think it's something that probably works best. Um, people are, I think, increasingly distrusting of anything media. Um, and you know, you, 10 years ago, you wanted to post your baby pictures online. Now I'm not so sure about that. So I think that that sets a fundamental shift. The second thing is that I, I kind of forgot to say that. We talk about political polarization, for instance, in the United States, or anywhere, actually, as it is an unintended consequence of something. Uh, but that probably is not true. Political polarization is a strategic tool for winning the elections. I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who works for a political party in a very large Asian democracy. He said, the elections are coming, and we're going to be polarizing because we want to win the elections. So when you see that, uh, you know, we can't always blame social media companies. We have, we have other people to blame, and they're very visible. You know, if you, if you see a social media company's infrastructure, I think that um, you can't blame infrastructure for what's happening. You can't blame roads for every road accident, right? So I think that's, that's another thing to think about, that um, polarization is sometimes very, very strategically used to um, gain certain advantages in the, in the voting group. So I think that, that would be my kind of take home. For Civic, I think it's very different. And I really study these things separately, too. 
Um, of course, they, they overlap sometimes, and yes, one could lead to the other, but I think they're very different concerns, and they're very different groups of people who are interested in, in these things. Uh, national politics is not interesting to most people. International politics is not interesting to 95% of people. Another thing that I realized is that if you think about, let's say, social media era versus non-social media era, people work more and earn less than 10 or 20 years ago. And you want them to do something else for you, right? So who's going to give them this time? So you know, integration of your activities into existing activities is better than saying, hey, can you, can you give me about an hour or two of your time every day? Between you know cooking, feeding babies, and, and like going to work and answering email uh, emails from work at 10 p.m. So I think that's also critical. We don't have 25 hours. We still have the same time. Um, anything that's perceived perceived to be invasive, that's taking time away, that's already very precious free time. I think that's going to be a problem. Um, uh, second question about the interviews. Uh, I was not dissing interviews in any way. I was just uh, locating them uh, historically. Um, <laughs> As a matter of fact, we just finished an interview study about uh, political uh, disconnection and unfriending in a, uh, during the Cat uh, Catalan crisis in Spain. So we like interviews. They're just such a pain to do. It's so much work. And you, know, you can collect data from 50 people. Compared to you know, my dreams from seven, eight years ago where I'm going to have data from everyone else. This is kind of disappointing. You know? um, but yes, interviews are great. and. Um, we just have, I mean, that's a matter of comparison. We have, I think, 700 pages of interview transcripts from 50 people. Imagine that we have 50,000 people, right? So what, what am I going to do with it? Spend a life for publishing one study? So it's, from my perspective, this is great data, but it's bringing me back to the old models where it took a while to collect data even from very few people. Um, of course, there are companies that have much more data and better computational abilities to process this data. But again, uh, these are this proprietary data, and I don't have access to it, and most people in this room will not have access to it. So it's not something that we can leverage on to, to answer any of these questions. Um, regarding the um, sort of the advertising uh, duopoly, I think that's pretty much clear. I mean, if you want to advertise anything online, I don't think there is 10 companies to go to. And uh, whether this has direct consequences on what we receive as our daily dose of news or uh, chatter or whatever, uh, we, can, we can discuss that. I think there are people in this room who have much better data than me. But um, you definitely have a global duopoly on advertising. That's for the first time in history. I mean, with the exception of maybe China. China has their own duopolies or triopolies. So I think that's, that's kind of something that we do need to keep in mind uh, if you are talking about access as well as data, data grab. Because eventually, you know, if I would say in a couple of years' time, the situation is going to get very different about how data can be monetized and whether it can be monetized at all. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a round of questions, please? So we've got uh, two there, one there, one there. Are there going to be any more after that if we did one round of four and then finish? Would that be OK with people? Yep. So let's just stop. Uh, uh, check the names. Um, <laughs> um, I've got a question for Marco. Um, so you're talking about polarization. Is everyone okay if I don't use this? Because I apparently can't use it very well. Use it. Okay. Um, so you said about people going off into their own separate communities and how that comes with the fear that it will increase polarization, but then you said that it actually decreases it. And you cited the example of marginalized communities developing skills and then going out into the big wide world. Um, when you said, I, I don't really see how one follows from the other, because if you have people in sort of echo chamber communities, they do develop those skills and then go out into the big wide world, but is there not a risk of them being perhaps radicalized within the echo chamber to the point where whilst the overall discourse does appear to have multi-polarity, they're kind of talking past each other, not to each other, because everyone's being radicalized in whatever chamber they chose to go to, and then they go out and they start just hurling abuse at each other, and that's basically social media at the moment. Thank you. And on that note, if I pass this down, can it stop with someone's... Oh, or we can use the fancy mics already in the room. That works. Hi. Um, my question is for Marco. 
So you just touched on it, but I'm curious about the research um, you might be doing at the University of Hong Kong, looking at the difference between sort of the duopoly of advertising and like Facebook and Google and everything in the West versus Baidu and uh, WeChat in China. And if you're seeing similar trends there that sort of match what you've seen in your research of like, I guess, polarization post elections, or whether there's just like a fundamental difference and if that helps inform um, depending on how uh, countries or companies choose to further encrypt or limit privacy or expand privacy or limit free speech, et cetera, like what sort of trends you're anticipating, any thoughts you have on it? Cool, and there was another question on that side, yep. Hi, thanks for both talks, so this is more for Marco. If we're all going into our echo chambers <coughs> and these small groups within them, how as an organization can we reach out to these people and try and change their mind on an issue? Cool, and then in that corner? Uh, I'll try to speak now. That's a question for Benjamin. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the methodology that Sigography uses and, um, and how far it allows the more deliberative process and also the engagement of people that are maybe not as comfortable engaging online. And if you've seen any impact of this in, um, on the policy outcomes or on the ability of creating a bit more of a community and trust in government. Thank you. Uh, stop with Mark instead. Um, let me address the echo chambers uh, question first. I think this is one of these uh, buzzwords that has been around for a while. Um, a group of five of your best friends, that's not an echo chamber, that's an ego chamber. It's just about a bunch of buddies. Um, a group of you know, 5,000 bigots who talk about racial supremacy, that, that's an echo chamber for sure. So our interest is really in these smaller groups. Because even these bigots and racists, they have a group of five of their best friends, and some of them may not be racist. It's very likely that they are, but some of them may not be. And saying things that others disagree with is easier in a group of close friends. So I think, you know, maybe I was, I, I was misunderstood that maybe I didn't uh, communicate this well enough. Um, the eco chamber, I think, responds, corresponds to these, I guess, partisan differences. But these are macro level differences between people, ideological differences. Um, I don't think that's what we were talking about here. We were talking about psychological similarity between people and the people who are close with strong ties, they can say anything to each other. And that for us, that's an important democratic benefit that you are able to speak your mind in front of five people or 50. It'd be better if it's 50, but we're happy with five. So I think that's that's a, that's a difference that we're I think looking into. It's not that some people watch Fox and the other watch MSNBC or something like that. I think we know that. Um, but in a group of five friends from high school, there is one guy who watches Fox and four four who don't. But they start talking about these things. I think that's kind of important. Um, uh, there was a question about oh yes yes okay about the ecosystem in, in Hong Kong and China. So uh, Hong Kong's ecosystem is identical almost to U.S. So it's basically Facebook and WhatsApp and nothing else. Uh, maybe a little bit of you know, oh, Instagram with, with younger folks. Twitter is more or less dead. Um, so Hong Kong doesn't censor uh, online media or doesn't restrict media access at all. So at least, at least that I'm aware of. China is a completely different ecosystem. One interesting thing about China uh, is that it basically skipped the Facebook stage. It had something like Facebook for a while, but it was kind of a long time ago. It wasn't very successful. So I think a week or two ago, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said, oh, this thing about WeChat, I should have listened to this earlier. Because if you think about all these other weird messaging services, um, they are not really social media. They are things that help you go through life. Like you can pay bills. You can get your passport. You can send mon money to your mother. Um, these are things that American social media companies never really considered, at least until now. So I think that that's the fundamental difference in models. Of course, uh, if we talk about uh, political engagement in China, uh, well, there are no elections, <clears throat> so no, no need to worry about that. Um, 
if you talk about civic engagement, uh, that's different actually. And for the first time, we actually managed to collect probably the largest data set from China. It took two years of negotiation because basically when you submit a request to do a survey in China, it has to be vetted, right? You can't just ask any question. And there are certain questions that will never be asked, but there are questions that are okay. Civic questions are okay. And that's, that's what we are kind of hoping to find out now. Um, we've done some research in China, and uh, uh, more specifically on environmental engagement. So what kind of uses, for instance, of social media and traditional media lead to environmental engagement? And surprise, surprise. So China has a centralized broadcast model. So basically, the um, government controls traditional media and still uses it in a kind of educational slash propagandistic purpose. So to educate the masses, right? That was the original aim of uh, newspapers and television. And so what we find is that people are, who are consuming traditional media, the gap between those who are not interested and those who are interested is actually narrowing down. So you have basically this kind of blasting information to everyone, and then even people who are not interested say, OK, yeah, the environment is a problem. Let me do something about it. On social media, the gap increases. Because people who are interested, they can do more things. People who are not interested in the environment, they go and look for fashion on social media or you know, shopping or something like that. They're not, they're not going to go for finding information on social media. We were actually hoping that to find um, kind of this accidental exposure to information, more like a lifestyle information about the environment. And we find this in Hong Kong, because basically social media is free. Uh, in China, what gets censored are not necessarily criticism of the government or uh, you know, postings or whinings about the government. It's calls for action. So mobilizational calls get censored. The other things don't get censored. So I think that's also another kind of a problem. Because if we collect these data sets, um, we are probably missing some of the important parts. At least if we collect it after they get censored. A colleague from the uh, University of Hong Kong, uh, Dr. Fu, Kim Wa Fu, he has uh, interesting data sets that give you WeChat before, sorry, Weibo before and after censoring. And you can see what kind of things are changing. They also have a very interesting lab. Um, WeChat lab that monitors government accounts in China. They literally bought 30 or 40 phones, and they have 30 or 40 phones in their lab. And these phones are checking government websites. And then you see that government websites, some information disappears from time to time. It's like, well, where is this information? Why is it not there? Because there's probably been a shift in policy. Right? And it just disappeared. Anyway, thank you. That's really interesting. I'm going to be thinking about those 30 or 40 phones for a while. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the question was around methodology, uh, and I only I heard I think most of it, um, but it's just a really deep topic. So I'm not gonna keep people from the full coffee break uh, to to delve too far into it. But um, briefly, for us, we we kind of really focus on not having a one size fits all methodology to what we do uh, or in how we measure it, because what we find is depending on the context that you are working and depending on the department and depending on the type of civic tech you're trying to do. So meaning uh, which kind of policy arm. So is this focusing environmentally, educationally? All of that really affects the like outcome you're looking for and kind of the methodology for what you kind of rack up to impact. Um, and so for us, we, we take it on a really context by context basis on when, uh, how, and part of that, I would also say, is a collaboration. So it's we work with cities because if they don't do this, it's not civic tech. We want we want the city's involvement, uh, and so because of that, understanding for them what uh, success or what impact is is actually important. And in some cases, they're much they're really interested in new ideas to solve a problem. In other instances, they're interested much more in how do we make a decision around this and, and kind of what informs the choice between three options. And those create a different, again, metric for impact. And so what we've developed is kind of a, a broad toolbox uh, that we use in different contexts. And that's something we've been doing over the last few years so that we can apply it in different ways to different kind of policy, city, region, nation, issue contexts. And that's part of how we, we work with and how we support cities. And so it's really important, I think, whenever, a lot of times, uh, Specifically with uh, designers, they want kind of an elegant solution. The tech people, they want a really elegant, simple solution. 
And I think that kind of trying to create the very elegant, simple uh, method metric uh, in this case is, I, I think, somewhat fraught. And so we try to have a little bit of a broader outlook on it. Um, in terms of developing our own kind of methodological theory around this, for us, it's just a capacity issue. So we're, we're not in a way where we can really robustly kind of double blind, uh, you know, post hoc t test a lot, um, just because of the nature of how we work. We'd like to. So if any of you are here from one of, from, you know, one of those very well-funded organizations and want to support that, uh, I don't, you know, commission or illuminate in the room or nest it, it would be wonderful. Uh, so we, we'd love to do that. Right now it's not a situation where we're able to do that as robustly, but that's something we're kind of looking towards in the midterm. So, thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, thank you to our two speakers, and uh, apologies. Oh, sorry, yes, yes, yeah.